So thanks for letting us come and speak with you today. Uh, my name is Lee Fox. That's Ryan Vanderwerf. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, how we can get groovy with Google Home. And uh, I guess we can go and just get started. So uh, we'll head right in and talk a little bit about Ryan. Uh, yeah, so I'm a software engineer on the uh, Grails team with OCI. Um, father of two kiddos, actually under 13 now. They keep getting older. I help co-chair a local uh, Groovy and Grails user group. And um, uh, I've co-authored with Lee a, an effective Gradle implementation uh, video series on PACT. And uh, since I work for OCI, I have to give him a plug. If you need any Grails or Groovy support, uh, we can help. Uh, just a reminder, we are giving away a Google Home uh, device. So if you haven't registered already, we're going to do the drawing 10 minutes after this talk is done. So make sure to head over there immediately and get signed up if you haven't already to, uh, to get in the running to win that. All right, so for me, um, my name is Lee Fox. I'm a cloud architect over at Infor. I'm uh, an agile DevOps and chat ops advocate, um, really involved with the community, uh, past technology chair of Agile Austin, where I'm from. Uh, I do a lot of uh, Alexa and Google Home development on the side, uh, worked with him on that Gradle video, and Innovation Games Facilitator, not that important right now. Um, what's more interesting is I'm an amateur chef, so if he and I totally bomb this, let's trade recipes afterwards. I'll try to make it up with you. <laughs> okay, so moving forward, uh, what we want to do today is we want to talk about what Google Home is, uh, talk about the evolution of uh, UIs uh, from traditional to uh, voice where we are right now. We'll talk about Google Actions, hit a demo on that. Uh, we'll follow up with uh, how we build those actions in Grails, and uh, we'll also look at how we build them in a more um, UI format with API UI, and then we'll demo that as well. So uh, moving on, uh, the Google Home. It's just a smart speaker. It's this guy right over here. And uh, the thing to keep in mind is that it is just the box. It's the hardware uh, component, the Google Home. Uh, what people tend to think of when they uh, look at the, the Google Home, uh, other smart speakers like uh, the Amazon Alexa or Amazon Echo, is the uh, UI behind it or the, the AI behind it. Um, even though this was released in 2016 in the US and uh, just recently in the UK, uh, it leverages the Google Assistant, which is the real, uh, the real meat and potatoes of the, uh, the technology. So uh, Google Assistant came from the previous iteration of Google Now, and uh, it is what, is what gives us all the functionality. So uh, try to, to differentiate what you see today with um, the hardware side of things and the software side of things. Uh, there's not a lot we can do with the hardware, uh, but we will talk about how we can write more software to integrate with uh, this device. So it offers some features. Uh, first of all, it's got far field technology. And what this is, is an array of speakers that uh, line the, the device. It uh, senses when people talk to it, and it will increase the volume on the microphone for uh, where it's loudest. It will decrease it from um, the microphones that uh, are not the loudest. And this gives it a chance to hear people from a further distance away and, and clear uh, text, uh, clear uh, voice communication. It's got voice identification, which admittedly uh, I have not played with yet. It's a brand new uh, feature that Google just uh, rolled out a couple of weeks ago. It allows uh, uh, multiple people to just using their voice identify themselves to the speaker and uh, pull up separate Google calendars um, so that things are more personalized to them. Integ integrates with a lot of Google services. Uh, translation, calendar, we'll go over those in, in a few minutes. I think those are probably the, uh, the strongest uh, software features that uh, the Google Home and Google Assistant offer in, is that uh, integration. So uh, the Google Assistant, as I mentioned, is uh, an iteration from uh, Google Now, and it's the voice AI. It has a lot of features in it. You can work with a calendar and get information from your Google calendars. You can look up uh, information like exchange rates. So if we were curious, hey, Google, how many uh, Danish kroner is one US dollar? One United States dollar is approximately six Danish kroner and 63 or. We can translate. Hey, Google, translate. We are excited to be here to present at Great Conf to Danish. 
My apologies. I don't understand. <laughs> hey Google, say I'm excited to be here in Danish. We can play music. I'm not going to play any music for you today. Uh, it's full of fun Easter eggs. So, uh, hey Google, what am I thinking? You're thinking, if my Google Assistant guesses what I'm thinking, I'm going to freak out. <laughs> That's totally true. Uh, hey Google, make me a sandwich. You're a sandwich. <laughs> My personal favorite. Hey Google, what does the fox say? Ring ding 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 a ding and wa pa 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 bow. Or so I heard. <laughs> so it's it's fun, it's useful technology, but how did we get to where we are today with this technology? Uh, we have to look at the evolution of uh, the UI, and I'm going to take you down a trip through, uh, through memory road. Um, it's going to make some of you feel old, but I promise you, I'm just as old. So how many people remember something like this? <laughs> yep, character-based interfaces. Probably uh, popular, most popular around the 70s. Uh, a lot of us called them green screens. A lot of readability issues on these. We were limited to 80 columns. Uh, as things started to progress, we got up to 120, which really didn't do us uh, that much more good. Um, we had to map characters for inputs. We didn't get full strings. And instead of uh, procurement, it was PROC. Instead of production, it was PROD. Or you might have even more obscure codes, like ICQRT. Uh, just to represent data that's on there, it, it took a lot of uh, user knowledge about the system. Uh, it really limited the data that was able to come in and out. So, yeah, through lots of abbreviations and codes. How about this one? Who recognizes this? <laughs> Can anyone Thank name you. it? This is Apple's Lisa. About the 80s is when we started to see GUIs. Uh, they were much more powerful. We weren't limited to the, uh, to the 80 or the 100 characters anymore, uh, but they were so heavyweight. I mean, there was a lot of, of power and processing and code that went behind them. And it was kind of justified. We needed it because we wanted to start putting uh, an interface together where people could leverage metaphors. You know, you had windows to describe each of this, uh, these little applications that were open. You had uh, a file uh, cabinet to represent your, your hard drive. And uh, everything was coded for interactive, um, intuitive actions based upon uh, these, these metaphors that you were, you were working on. But most importantly, it allowed us to fit a lot more data on the screen. Again, those days of 120 characters, 80 character column displays, they were gone. How about this? I use Mosaic. <laughs> we started to get into the uh, web sometime around the 90s, and this changed the way that we organize the information. So we're, we're still in this GUI interface, right? But uh, now we want to map the data so that uh, it became important how we got to it, the number of clicks, and it just changed the way that, that we thought about uh, putting together data and organizing the input. We get to mobile in, uh, interfaces. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the first iPhone. I'm proud to say that I had it, and it changed my life, let me tell you. Changed my life sometime around the 2000s. Uh, we discovered that more information wasn't necessarily better. You know, you go from a big display, 15 inches, down to, uh, to just three or four inches. It changed what we could fit on there, and you couldn't see all of that stuff. Um, more importantly, you couldn't, you couldn't interact with it so much. So it introduced this concept of, of gestures. And the best way that I can describe this is to think about Angry Birds. Surely we're all familiar with that game. You know, back in the day, if I wanted to write an Angry Birds game, my interface would have had a button that would allow me to move the, uh, the bird up and down. I'd click it and click it and click it until it got to the right angle. And then I'd have another one that would pull it back until it was the right power. And then I'd have a launch button and it would shoot and go and knock down some pigs. But um, with, with mobile interfaces, we started to change the way that we looked at it. We got the gesture. Now instead of um, all that stuff to launch a bird, that was it. And uh, 
we, we get um, swiping to change screens, we get, um, we get swiping to accept dates or pass dates by, we, uh, we get uh, the ability to zoom in and zoom out. It, again, this changed just how we looked at the data. And then we come to where we are today, what we're going to talk to you about with voice interfaces. Because um, nowadays, we've got nothing to look at with this technology. There is nothing in, in this data that, that you're going to see. Uh, so speaking patterns um, are complex too. And we need to interact with, uh, with the technology, both on the input and, and the output. So um, when, when, we, when we take the input from the user, we could say things like, uh, tell me a joke, or tell me a good joke, or make me laugh. All of these things are going to fire off the same bit of code, and we need to map this, this human language down to something that, that is binary and just a bunch of ones and zeros to dispatch off of and execute our code. On the output side, um, responses need to be descriptive, and they need to be interactive, and they need to, to hold the user's attention. So uh, if you get um, a response that's long and drawn out, uh, it gets boring. If you don't have pauses put into to your speech responses that you're putting out, it gets horrible because I could talk to you like this every single day and go on and on throughout the rest of this presentation and at some point in time, people are just going to get up and leave because I will not put a pause into what I'm saying. <laughs> the same is gonna be true with, with uh, the, the way that we're interacting with the, uh, the UI or the voice UI. We want to get something out of it that's going to hold our attention and, and allow us to uh, interact with it. So uh, that's the, the evolution of uh, the UI from the traditional green screens all the way through a voice technology. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Ryan and he's going to walk us through the actions and uh, do some of the demos for us. Okay, so we all know why we're here and why this is you know, important. And certainly uh, people think of use cases for this that are beyond um, toy things. Like uh, I've heard a lot of stories from disabled people or think people like, um, they have problems getting up. Uh, elderly people that may have fallen down, they can call for help. There's all these kinds of things people have been making for these to make people's lives better. So it's definitely a, a neat technology that is definitely more than just a toy. So how do we make some of this stuff? So the heart around uh, the Google stuff is called actions. And these actions um, work on this or a mobile phone. Uh, it's gonna be working on their messaging services going forward. So this is the official definition of what actions are. <coughs> Actions on Google uh, uh, let you build it for the Google Assistant. Integrations help engage users through Home Today in the future, Pixel, Allo, and other experiences where it'll be available. So they're planning on bringing this all over the place. Google Assistant, Lee kind of talked about that. That's just the intelligent assistant. And the kind of the evolution of this is it can now do two-way conversations. It used to be talk to it, ask it a question, and give you an answer back. And that was kind of the end of the interaction. We want to make something that's more than that, right, where we have uh, a conversation. So this is what the actions flow looks like. So we've got uh, the device here, and what's gonna happen is we're gonna find a invocation trigger, which is like the name of our action that we've said. It's gonna respond as this thing, like a color finder or weather finder. And then what's gonna happen is it's gonna go through this input processing. We're gonna, inside of our action, we're gonna decide what we're gonna output, and it's gonna send that back, and this is gonna like read it to you, basically. So again, we don't ever talk, uh, making our actions, we never talk directly to the user's device. It always goes through their service. Uh, same thing with the uh, Amazon device. All right, so the action is the block that you declare for a particular conversation to happen. This kind of includes a couple key things. There's something called a default action or greetings. That would be like the, okay, I've in, uh, invoked this, now I'm gonna say, you know, hello, uh, I'm here to help you, what do you want? And uh, at that point, you do responses or queries to follow a de default action. Uh, they call that an invocation trigger. And then we have, after that, something called query patterns. And what that is is a sample sentences that, that help Google decide whether it's going to call, uh, what bit of code it's going to call for you based on uh, giving it some training uh, to do that. And, and Google's really good at not needing a lot of examples compared to the way the uh, Alexa service works. So here's how what happens when you talk to it, right? We've got a uh, trigger phrase here. Uh, it was going to be, you know, okay, Google. 
is going to wake up, and then we'll say, talk to um, color finder. I'm not sure how to help with that. Oops, you got you to say it fast enough. But we're going to say, uh, talk to, in this case, like personal chef is one of the examples they have. That's the invocation name that you specify as developer. And obviously, it has to be unique. If someone else has picked that name, then it's not going to work. That's the kind of limitation. And then we can add a preposition. So we could stop here. And then it would play the default welcome intent, because we didn't specify any other intent for it to do. Or we can add a preposition and say, uh, talk to it about, and then something here, like a subject. And this is an action phrase. This is what invokes the actual action. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about homemade cannoli. So there's an example app where it'll, it'll, you can ask it what recipes you can make with that. And we don't need to worry about you know uh, trigger phrase. That's built in. That's you know the Google or um, you can say hey uh, in this name as well. Uh, and the invocation name again. We can set this in the uh, console, and then um, at that point we add our preposition, and then we've got our initial trigger. Uh, these intents are uh, each one's a unique name for a function it's going to call. Um, you can. Uh, stack them in the same code if you want with like a switch statement and then branch off or you can use uh, in the example I'll show you they've got a builder or you can add handlers um, or you can make them as separate controllers in, in your application. It's completely different URL endpoints. It's really up to you. A little bit more about query patterns. Again, these are the sample phrases used to train it. Uh, simple to what's called a sample utterance in Alexa. Uh, and what you do is you embed parameters inside of those, so you can parameterize something like, tell me about the color blue. Blue is the parameter. So it's going to pass that in, and your code is going to see that as a parameter. And the last part of this is something called HTTP execution. So now when it finds that action, and uh, you've given it a preposition, and it knows what it's going to fire, it's going to have to call a URL to fulfill that. And that's what we use for uh, URLs for actions and a couple rules. It must be SSL. It must have a valid certificate. Uh, and then these exchanges beyond that point between the HTTP call are all JSON exchanges. Uh, some, there's some tools that you need to use to get this working. Uh, one's a binary you have to download here. Uh, once I said the slides out, it's got the link for it. It's called GAction CLI. Uh, we're going to need the Google Console to set up our skill. Um, but the G-Action CLI does most of the work, and it's a, just a command line thing. So when you want to start it up, you just say G-Action's init. It'll ask for your credentials. It can create a sample uh, action.json file, which is the metadata I talked about, those, those intents and things like that. Uh, and you have to get the specific version. It supports Windows, Mac, and Linux. And uh, you can also run a preview of your thing without ever sending anything to the console. You can just call this G-Action preview, <coughs> give it a package name and invocation name, and... Um, let me scroll over here. And then you can temporarily use an invocation name, and that will last however long you do it. You can add a parameter called to tell how many minutes it will be active for, and then after that it just goes away. Uh, you can also run something called G-Action Simulate, and it creates a simulator. You can textually interface with it by typing the conversation instead of saying something. And then you can also deploy it. If you have something in production, you can deploy this uh, action uh, to a live system. It has to go through the approval process first. Uh, a couple tips, add dash dash for boast to any of it. It tells you more if you get any kind of error. Um, Another thing that's going to happen is there's a new console. So this came out on the May 17th. It kind of threw a monkey wrench in our presentation because it all stopped working. Uh, and we've had to redo it. And we've got this action v2 JSON file now in our GitHub repo. And you have to run this so that the console knows about your application. It can definitely save you some typing. There still is some form filling to do. So to get this working, you just go to uh, console console.developers.google.com. You find the API. Here's our projects. So I've got one called Color Finder here. And uh, to, to get it working, you go down to Library, and you have to find uh, Actions. So Google Actions API, you find that. And then you can attach that to a project. Right now, this is attaching this to the Color Finder. 
And so what happened at May 17th, they made a new console. It says, here, visit our new console. This one doesn't really work anymore. Uh, thanks a lot, Google. And then it's a lot, it's a lot nicer, though. Um, this is the new console. And I've got a project here called Groovy Color Finder that I made. And it's got, these are the metadata here. So we can define two types of things. We can use the Actions SDK or API AI, which is a service uh, that, that Google acquired that give, gives you a visual way to make these actions. And then you can use webhooks to call in to do that. And I'll show you that here shortly. Uh, but you go through here, you pick whether it's Actions SDK or API AI, and then you've got your metadata. So I've got some stuff here. It's got the details. You just fill out images. You can pick the voice you want. So you get two male voices and two female voices, and then a description of what your action does, and then uh, some help for the user, things you can ask it. So here we're going to say, ask, you, ask Groovy Color Finder to find a brighter color for cyan or magenta or something like that. You can also find darker colors. And we've got testing instructions, contact details. You have to have a pr uh, privacy policy that's required to be able to publish it. So once you have all this filled out and you're happy with it, uh, you can submit that to them for certification, and they're going to run through a testing process and either accept it, and that would be available in the actions directory, or they'll reject it and give you a reason why, and then you'll have to try again. And the other thing in the console here is a simulator. It's pretty decent. Uh, so we specify a surface. So the two kinds of things it supports right now is the phone or the Google Home. And then we can uh, type something here, like... Say, ask Groovy Color Finder, and that's our invocation name. And then we're going to give a preposition to find, uh, in this case, a brighter color for cyan. And so here's the request that happens, uh, sure. JSON. The test version of Groovy Color Finder. Hey, it works. Now tell something so I could repeat it. So in this case, it guessed improperly what my intent was to fire, and it, it just chose the default one. Uh, for whatever reason. Um, I can also ask it. I can say, um, hey, Google, ask Groovy Color Finder to find a brighter color for cyan. Sure, here is the test version of Groovy Color Finder. The brighter color for cyan is aqua. So we've got an example project here that does that. And what it is, it, what's happening behind the scenes is it actually looks up a java.awt.color tries to match that against a directory of colors in this uh, code, and then it iterates through and it'll try 100 times to find a brighter color that has a name that is in English, uh, and then says that back to you. And if it can't, like there's certain ones that it can't do, like red, right? Uh, it can't figure that out, because there's technically there is no brighter color. Uh, so you have to do like kind of funky in between ones for the sample, which is fine. All right, let's get back to here. All right, so this action.json, let's talk about this. This is the main metadata file for your actions. Uh, let me take a look at uh, the one we've got here. So here's the file. Uh, this is defining your actions. We've got a description here. Here's the main one. Uh, this one I call a conversation called echo. That's the one I just it mistakenly invoked, where you can say something and it'll basically echo it back to you. Uh, that will happen if it doesn't have any kind of context. Uh, then we can fire up other intents. One's called color intent. That's just the one I showed you. Uh, it says, uh, finds a brighter color. So uh, it's got a parameter called color. Uh, these are the little types they have predefined. They've got a color type, text type all kinds of different types. And then we've got an example query pattern. It says, find a brighter color for blah. And it's got the parameters in it. And that's how it knows to fire that one up. And I've got one here. It's the opposite of that. It's a darker color intent. Same type of thing, but it finds the darker color of whatever you give it. And then at the end, we map that to a conversations list that gives a name of which one of those things above it was for, and then what URL it calls. So I've got all of these uh, deployed as a Grails app with different uh, controller endpoints here. So two ways to do that. There's an action SDK for Java. So there's an early port of the Node SDK, because Google only technically supports Node as their SDK. Uh, that's the only thing they've developed that they give, give you. Uh, this guy, um, uh, 
Mercoslaw Stantec made an unofficial port of that on GitHub, and that's what I've been using for the demo here, and I'm wrapping that in, in Grails. A uh, couple things it doesn't support, though, that are, you know, it needs to is SSML or conversation context. That's like a session context. Uh, because sometimes you need context to conversation. Say when you first start the conversation, it might ask you what your name is. Well, if you have follow-up questions to that, you might want to be able to say their name again later. That context is what gives you that. So those two things are missing. But it can do most of the basic stuff that you need to uh, play around with this technology, and it'll get better. Um, we've got you know Grails demo here that enables using this in uh, Grails three. All right, so this Grails actions uh, demo here consists of a controller so we've got this thing called uh, assistant action controllers is where it's mapping to uh, and this when you're using in this SDK you have to use this builder pattern and you have to create a uh, request handler and request handler factory for each one of your uh, actions that's going to be inside of it so here I've got I'm calling a um, uh, a main and text one, that's for the response for the echo part. And then we've got a color uh, intent and a darker color intent. I'm not actually using those up here. I've instead mapped that to a different URL endpoint in my controller. Called co First one's called color. And so he really only knows about this handler factory for colors. And that's where we end up putting our gut, uh, the guts of it in. Once we get past the factory, which is down here, uh, this factory is just a simple wrapper that sets up the, uh, your handler. And then here's the actual code we've got inside of here, right? So we've got, uh, all it has to do is say get response. And what it's doing here is try to find an AWT color that you give it, looks that up, and then it tries to go in this thing called color utils, which is a library I found, and it will try to find a brighter uh, name for a color, right? Because there are RGB values, right? Not all RGB values have color names. So what it does is that iterates through and tries to find one. If not, it'll just say, sorry, I can't find a brighter color for this thing. And what we do is we return with a, uh, this response builder, tell response. Um, that means it's going to say something and then end the conversation. So the other kind of response you can say is an ask response. That's something when you say something, it's expecting to hear something back. And it's going to wait for you to say something. If you don't say something in several seconds, then it gives up. And that's, that's pretty much how it works. So I've got a, uh, in the same thing here, I've got one for the darker color, and it's just calling the inverse, basically, of that. Um, I write these things out to files here because uh, it's really hard to debug this stuff. Uh, and one easy way to do that is to write the request to a file, and then you can call uh, your Grails app with the curl command instead of waiting for Google to call it. And then you can step through in your debugger to figure out where the bug is in your code, uh, which I find... Uh, it really helped me write this stuff to where I could figure out what was going on, because not all of it's documented very well. All right, we talked about the handlers and handler factories. Uh, they're all, they just go under source main groovy. Um, and again, that maps to your uh, action JSON file. You know, every project has to have one. Again, you can do con many controllers or put it all in one controller. It's up to you. Um, so let's talk about the different ways. So that's the first way, right? That's the uh, action, actions SDK, they call it. The other way is to use API AI. This service lets you build projects that are uh, kind of GUI-based, where I can just type in things and create things called ent uh, intense entity for uh, what we call webhooks. So I've made a Grails plugin to make a webhook in a Grails app. And all you have to do is implement a trait on your controller, and it will fill in an index uh, method that's got all of the setup stuff for you. And then you just have to call, add a method called do webhook that you override, and then you, it, it will handle all your stuff there. So let's just look at the most simple example. I made this uh, weather test uh, thing here. So I've got an intent, and I can just add one right here, which is kind of neat. So I added one called weather in London. And then you give it uh, context of what the user says. So I say weather in San Francisco, weather in London. I can say, you know, weather in Copenhagen. And what it does is it's smart enough to figure out, oh, you meant a city, right? So now it's going to say this maps to an entity called GeoCity. I happen to have a database of those things. Um, and then it resolves the value as being this. 
So at that point, you can go down to an action. And you say, OK, well, now I've got an action called uh, Yahoo Weather Forecast. And now I'm going to say it uses the parameter GeoCity. I can make it required or not required. I can add multiple parameters to it. Uh, and then I can also give a default response. If no response happens, it, it'll do this. I am broken. And then at the, at the last part of here is the key bit. We say use webhook, right? So that means I'm not going to try to resolve this internally in this WYSIWYG thing I made. I'm going to go somewhere external and find this weather information in this case. Uh, so what we do is we go down to this uh, button here called fulfillment. Uh, let's cancel. We can save that. All right. So we go down to fulfillment here. And I've created a, um, uh, this is running on a server instance that I've got. Uh, we'll call this webhook and then invoke that and then get the right response and then I'll be able to do it. And I, and I can try it right now even from the console. Um, so I can type weather in. Let's see how right the weather is here. So I see. All right, so it says here. Uh, the weather here is uh, for this date is the high of lows. This is Fahrenheit. Sorry, it's, I, I know it should be Celsius probably, uh, and it's uh, partly cloudy. And I can play that too if the you want. The weather in Copenhagen for the first of June 2017 is a high of 65 and a low of 51, and it will be partly cloudy. So, you know, right there, and it shows you the JSON that it used. Uh, this is a little bit misleading. This isn't the JSON that gets sent to your webhook. Uh, if you want to de debug that, you have to in your uh, skill or your action, uh, write that to a file, and again, replay it with curl, and then send those requests to your Grails app until you can debug what's going on and why it crashes. This is the most unhelpful uh, debugging tool I could think of, because it only happens, it's either 200 OK and it's great, or 206 no content, or 206 partial content. Those are the only errors it ever gives you. So your app can completely crash and burn, and you'll be left scratching your head like, well, this doesn't look like the JSON I got, right? Um, so keep that in mind when you look at this. Well, let's take a look at the uh, uh, code here. So I've made a weather webhook controller, and this is what was called when I just demoed that right now. Um, I've got, uh, all I have to do is uh, implement this AI webhook controller, and then um, I can say do webhook. And then it's got this object here uh, that's part of their SDK um, that's meant for like a servlet. So I've, I've modified that to work with Grails, uh, or wrapped it, I should say. And then it's got this fulfillment object, which is what you're going to return data in. So in this case, I'm just building up a uh, query for Yahoo. I'm doing a, a checking of the weather. And then I'm getting back the data I want uh, for the city, uh, a high and low. And then you can change the units, I think, in here, too, to be Celsius. And then we just set our speech. And we set display text. So you can set these as two separate things. Uh, the reason for that is in your... Um, your uh, Google Home application on your phone, it'll actually keep a written record of uh, all your calls that you made to it. Uh, and you can say more wordy things when it's displaying there, like a URL, right? But you never want it to speak a URL. That would be really annoying. Or hashtags or anything like that. So you would never want that. So you could send, make two different results, one that's more visual, and then one that's meant for it talking it out. Uh, and then you can just set a source here, and then it'll come back to API AI and uh, serve up the results. So at that point, you've got API AI uh, web integration. We've got one other thing we can do here. Uh, we can use something called data services. So that's the other way to do it. That was a webhook, what I showed you. Uh, you can use something that's kind of the inverse of that called a data service. And what that does is if you have a skill made with API AI, you can call it from other applications directly. And what happens is in your API AI console here, you uh, go to the settings, and it gives you a token. And then you can use that token in your application with the Grails plugin. You just add that as a config value. And then uh, you can um, implement a different trait, which is this guy right here. I called it AI data controller is my sample one. So we just implement this trait here, which is in the plugin. And I can take a, like a query parameter from the request and then uh, say, you know, weather in Copenhagen, right? And as long as I URL encode it, 
uh, so that it works here, it will return that answer back to me. So that kind of opens up a possibility of if you had some AI making decisions for things, you could actually make your application ask Google's AI what it should do in a certain case and then respond accordingly. So you could have this thing like fed off of real-time data and be super dynamic if you wanted to. Uh, this is uh, you know, the most basic example possible here, but it does open up some interesting uh, possibilities that you could do with it. Uh, you could make something that responded to like stock prices or something, right? And uh, maybe the thing would behave differently and send you alerts of like, oh, you know, the stock's tanking, better dump it or something. Uh, you could make an auto trading application, then go do that, right? It would make it a lot easier to do that than uh, writing all that stuff yourself. So to use the data services uh, in, in this webhook thing, we just add a plugin to the build.gradle file. You add this property called the API AI key, and that's that client token that I showed you that you get from the API thing. You can do all that for free. Um, and then again, just create a controller, implement that trait, uh, and delete any kind of default index uh, method because it's gonna, the trait will automatically inject that in there with all the minutia of stuff that you don't want to have to worry about. We talked about that. We talked about webhooks. Same thing with webhooks. Uh, you know, get this working. I showed you. You just create a project in API AI. What it does, you have to have a Google Cloud account because they're two, the two things are linked together now. That Google owns that. Uh, it used to be an independent thing that worked with other speech services, but it really only works with Google now. So, uh, what happens is when you create a project in API AI, it's actually creating a Google Cloud project as well. Uh, one thing, if you got a free tier account, uh, you're limited to like only a few projects, and you have to like beg for more. So, uh, and it's real hard to get rid of them, I found out, after you create them, even if you delete them. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, and then we create that intent action right here that we did. And then we go on fulfillment, put our URL into it. And again, the same rules apply. It's gotta be SSL, it's gotta be a valid cert uh, that your Grails app is running on. It can't go to HTTP, whatever. It needs to be accessible from Google's cloud, right? So Google's cloud needs to be able to communicate to this thing. You, know, you don't call it, it calls you. So. Um, it can't be something on a private land that it can't talk to. And this other thing's got pre-built agents, so it can do, so they've got kind of a directory of stuff. So you can make actions with just built-in things here and kind of pull information uh, from stuff, like you know, hotel, food delivery, other people that have added stuff. Yeah, my battery's getting low, I better plug in. All right, and so we did our uh, weather webhook. So in summary here, building actions in Grails is for uh, Google Home, and that's really for the phone too. Uh, you don't need to have one of these devices. Uh, you use the unofficial Java SDK, or you can use API, AI, data services, and webhooks. Uh, this Java SDK effort's ongoing, so if anyone does uh, get super interested in this, wants to send pull requests, uh, please do. You can make it better. Uh, and you can, it's enough to build simple conversations and actions uh, for the time being. And uh, you know, based on you know how, I don't think it's a fad. This thing may evolve into something great. And then they have another one called the Show that's like a video enabled, and communicate with people, video message, and all that fun stuff. So I think this stuff's here to stay, and it'll keep evolving. Uh, what to do, you can try the girls plug in out, you can uh, submit PRs for any of these SDKs uh, to get some more momentum going. If you've got bug reports and things like that, let us know. Uh, and here's all the sources where we got all the stuff to build it, build it from. Uh, and so we got a few minutes left for questions. Um, anyone have any questions about this stuff? Don't be shy. <laughs> I believe they're launching uh, this home device in uh, several European countries this summer. I know France is one of them and uh, um, a couple others. So um, they may roll out before Alexa does in most of Europe. We'll see. But in the meantime, you can try it on your phone. It works too. I think Google has probably got the, uh, the head start in adoption in, in other countries because uh, um, 
their, their powerful translation service. I talked to a couple of people over at Amazon, and it is a significant effort for them to roll out a new language. Uh, even going from US English to UK English, they, there was enough differences there, uh, subtle as they may be, that they had to treat that as a brand new uh, language and give it its own rollout date and everything. I think Google is ahead on that curve. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming. Go in and get yourself one of these.